My name is Craig, and I'm going to teach you about weather. I originally got into weather in order to do fantasy worlds with reasonable weather patterns. In order to do that, I had to learn how the Earth's weather worked, and that's what I'm going to teach you today. It's going to be simplified with an eye towards using it in fantasy settings. Sun shines upon the Earth, the equator gets hot, the poles stay cold. This creates a number of cells. This is where air patterns circulate. They stay pretty much within these cells, which I'll explain in a bit. And the cells circle the Earth like donuts. There are three to the north, and there are three to the south. There are the Hadley, the Feral, and the Polar, the Hadley, the Feral, and the Polar, and you won't be quizzed, so don't worry about it. Now, I've said that these things are like donuts. In fact, they're more like slinkies. Let me see if I can explain. Here is the Hadley cell. There's one to the south as well. Now, because the air is hot at the equator, it rises. And then it scoops over the top, crashes down to the planet, and drags across the surface. This happens on the other side as well. This results in a fairly reliable wind blowing towards the equator at all times. These are called the trade winds, and they're very famous. Of course, these trade winds then circle into the sky and loop back around like a slinky. The upper air machinations don't matter. We're only focusing on what happens at the surface, and the trade winds are what happens at the surface. Now up here we have the feral cell, which goes in the opposite direction. So you'd think that the wind would also go in the opposite direction. And you'd be right, but the wind in the feral cell is actually not nearly as reliable, and they're called the prevailing winds, and they are not quite as important to our simulation. The reason that the prevailing winds are so important is because we can tell exactly how all of the air is going to be moving. This means that if we stick a continent down here, we can see exactly how the wind is going to hit it and what that means for the continent. I'll get more into that in a couple of minutes. Where the cells interact is also critical. So, because all of these cells end up going, pulling air in the same direction at the same spot, they create a banded structure. This is a low pressure zone that circles the, circles the equator of the planet. Then there's a high pressure zone at the upper latitudes, another low pressure zone, and then a polar high up at the very top. These matter. Low pressure zones generally mean that the air can't hold as much water, and they usually have been filling up with water because they've been moving across the surface of the planet, which is generally wet. That means that whenever there's a low pressure zone, you get lots and lots of rain. High pressure zones bring in the sky. This upper atmosphere air is cold and very dry, which means that you don't have any moisture in it, and that means you get clear sunny skies and not much in the way of moisture. And this repeats to some extent up here as well, all of the it's not quite as uh, uh, exaggerated, not quite as prevalent. This is not um, some kind of absolute. These weather patterns are quite a bit more complicated, but in general, high pressure areas are sunny and low pressure areas are rainy. This is also a primary weather force on the planet. This is the uh, this area has a lot of names, but basically any weather pattern that's down here in the middle of the planet has its fundamental power source is this. It is powered by this. This causes it. This is the menace. This thing throws off hurricanes. This thing causes doldrums. It causes seasonal weather distribu disturbances. And it causes the continuous rain that happens at every equatorial place. A clear example of this is Africa, which here's my crappy Africa. And what you have is you have the equator here, and then you've got the feral cell here, uh, it, the feral cell starting here. And so you have your cells like this, and the trade winds are running like this, right? Here, it's green. Here, it's desert. 
uh, there are a lot of other factors involved here. Um, it may very well be that uh, the desertification of this area is not is, is not entirely due to the high pressure fronts coming down and then skating back down like this. There are a lot of other reasons for those desertification to, 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 for that dry area, but it certainly doesn't help. And this area is definitely wet almost entirely because of this low pressure front, this low pressure not a front, this low pressure trough that crosses the entire planet and cuts right through Africa. And you can quite clearly see that if you just go to Google Earth and type Africa and put it on satellite view. This gets us a little bit into the idea of continents and what happens. So if we have trade winds like this, then the trade winds are crossing over a large amount of water. They pick up every bit of moisture they can carry. When they slam into the continent, they just dump it. And that makes the eastern side of the continent extremely wet. In general, if you look at rain patterns, you can see this quite clearly. So if we have a continent like this, and here's the, here's the equator, and here's the trade winds, you can actually see exactly how much rainfall happens, exactly how much precipitation. And it's like there's some out in the ocean, and then there's a whole lot here, and then there's not very much here, and there's not very much here, and then it starts to pick up again. So you actually get this lee, where it's dry due to the fact that it's dumped all of its water and it's coming in off of a dry surface rather than off of an ocean. And that's harder to see because it's not something you can pick up on Wikipedia, but if you look hard enough you can find precipitation maps that include ocean precipitation, and you can see this very clearly. The, uh, the trade winds pick up the moisture, then they dump it, and then they start to pick it up again after they spend some time on the ocean. In general, for our fantasy worlds, that means that the longer these trade winds run across the ocean uninterrupted, the heavier the rain is going to be when they hit something. Winds also don't run all the time, or rather they don't run straight all the time. If your continent has quite a lot of mountains, then the winds will turn away. This means that uh, the inner area probably won't catch any of that ocean breeze. They'll, uh, it'll be stuck with the dry air from the inside of the continent. Now all of that basically uh, sums up the, the fundamental ideas that are behind the Hadley cell and how you're going to use it in any kind of simulation. The feral cell is uh, sort of similar, but its pressures aren't nearly so high. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't gather as much water, it doesn't dump as much water, it's not as hot. Um, and it doesn't have the same kind of winds. However, there are a couple more factors you need to know before you go off and start to do it on your own. One of those is sun. During the spring and the fall, the sun shines on the equator, but during the summer and the winter, it doesn't. The Hadley cells aren't bumping up against each other at the equator, they're bumping up against each other at the thermal equator. So during the summer, the Hadley cells move north, and during the winter they move south, and they extend or crush the other cells as well. Now this means that that low pressure area moves north over time, and the high pressure area also moves north. This creates a continuous pushing and pulling of air, and that also changes exactly where the nasty weather or good weather is. This is the reason why a lot of places have spring or fall weather that drops 10 inches of rain on them. It's because these low pressure zones cross over onto their land or get close enough that they cause these deluges. And the last detail that you may not know is that the Earth heats quite a lot faster than the ocean. So the ocean will stay at whatever temperature it's intending to stay at. It pretty much resists the sun's heat. Uh, it does heat slowly, but um, in terms of what we care about, it, it's basically going to be a fairly typical temperature. It's going to be a fairly standard temperature year-round. It's more affected by the flow of, uh, of ocean oceanic currents, but we're not going to do anything like that, at least not in this video. However, the land heats and cools very quickly. This means in the day, you get this warm air rising, 
in the upper atmosphere. It crosses over, falls back down, and you get the wet ocean current, the wet ocean wind, rather, blowing back up into the land. This is very familiar if you've ever lived on the coast. Now, this might not be the case if the ocean is unusually hot or cold, but uh, it's uh, pretty standard. During the night, this often reverses. This cools. The ocean doesn't change very much. So now the ocean is the warmer one, or at least warmer than, uh, warmer in comparison to how it was, and you get this situation where it goes in the opposite direction, and you get the air from the land blowing back out into the ocean. This is a very, very small circulation. It's not a, has nothing to do with the Hadley cells or Farrell cells or any of that. This is just local air currents. However, it doesn't just mean, it's not just the day-night cycle, it's also the seasonal cycle. So in the spring, the land will heat up towards its summer temperature much faster than the ocean, which means that in the spring, you get a lot more of this oceanic weather, this, is, this, this breeze from the ocean. Combined with the uh, Hadley cells starting to overlap on you, this creates serious, serious weather. And you can see this happening across quite a lot of Asia um, and some parts of Africa. These, uh, these spring storms or fall storms end up being a major source of, of uh, weather, of important weather for your simulation because there's a massive, just a tremendous difference between an area that is wet and rainy all the time and an area that has wet and dry seasons. <sighs> well, I think that's probably enough for one video. And later I'll tell you a few more details. That maybe I'll do another video on how to do uh, weather at higher altitudes or, or uh, weather at higher latitudes, um, how altitude affects it, Things like mountains, you generally get a lot of rain coming in off of the mountains because it forces the air up, which causes it to lose all of its moisture and it comes raining down, all of that stuff. But I think that this has been long enough, so we can stop here.